Hello, welcome back to uh, Modus Works Monday. This is Modus Works Monday number two. Today I am going to show you uh, what it is that I have made in the past, uh, kind of just a brief breakdown, uh, and then I'm going to show you the distinction between the um, CNC mill right here and the manual mill uh, in the very, very back of the shop. Um, so just going to show you what all uh, the differences are between the two uh, two models of spinner that I make now, which is the Spinema thing, which is the um, handmade model, and the Machinima thing, which is made on CNC machine. So I'll throw you on the tripod and we'll look at uh, um, all the things I had kind of outlined there and then uh, look at the Spinema thing versus the Machinima thing and then I'll show you how they're made. So here's my Pelican case. Ah, goodness. Okay, so kind of go down the line um, from the first thing that I made, uh, or the first things that I made, um, and then progressing to uh, more recent stuff. Um, actually, what I have, what I did in the very beginning, is not in the Pelican case. They're, they're right here. So this is a spike. Uh, let's see how messed up it is. Yeah, that's pretty uh, pretty bent there. I use that for a lot of times for holding um, things when I'm flaming them, like mokuta, um, stuff like that. I'll I'll use this to hold whatever it is that I'm flaming, so I'm not burning my fingers. But this was um, a spike, an ice pick inspired by Jimmy Duresta. Uh, Jimmy Duresta has an awesome YouTube channel um, where he does a lot of uh, sort of how-to videos. Um, but that's what he did years ago. Now he's more into the vlog style. Um, but that was inspired by him and these are extremely useful and you can always pull the spike out and replace it with a new one. Uh, it's a friction fit. So. so that was one of the first things. This is the very first thing that I made on the first lathe that I ever got. Um, so this is a fire piston. This was inspired by Click Spring on YouTube. Um, he makes clock, well he made a clock, uh, I think maybe two clocks now, and now he's working on an Antikythera me mechanism, um, which is kind of like a uh, stellar, stellar mapping um, type mechanically driven um, navigation device from back like in ancient Greek times or something. It's crazy. But anyways, he was the inspiration behind this project. So a fire piston, if you don't know, is you can put a little tiny piece of charcoal in this little divot end right here and then put it insert it into the the barrel and then smack it smack it on a log and compress it fully and it compresses the air and heats the air up compressed air gets very hot heats the air up to the point that this will make a little ember um, so i thought that was the coolest thing and i thought well hey what better uh, project to uh to start with on my my lathe so um, this is probably it was the first successful piece I had made. Uh, maybe two or different, two or three different ones that were not so successful. Uh, I had to get the bore right uh, and, and make sure it was was nice and smooth. And the butt cap comes off like so, and then the end here threads off of the piston, and there are extra supplies. There's an extra O-ring in there and then there's some uh, charcoal in there so you can uh, it's all o-ring sealed I've actually got Teflon on that to keep it sealed to keep it from getting wet if you took it backpacking or something so I've never actually used it out like that but uh, I'm sure I have no uh, no qualms about taking it with me if, if I did go backpacking and needed a way to start a fire it definitely definitely works so then that moves us on to the lanyard beads. So this is one of the very first lanyard beads I ever made. One of my friends suggested to me, he said, hey, why don't you make a lanyard bead? I'm gonna zoom in a little bit just so you can see a little bit better. He said, hey, why don't you make a lanyard bead? I said, okay, what's a lanyard bead? And he said, it's just a little bead thing. It's like a keychain, hangs off of uh, your keys or off a knife or off a implement such as this. And uh, so, I went home, made three or four, and I took them back and I said, here, pick one. So he got, he got one, 
And I kept one on here, and then I'm not sure where the other one went. I may have given it away to a customer or something. But um, that's that's all uh, the very first two projects that I started out with. Now moving on to the case. So um, let's see. This is the very first bead uh, that I made out of aluminum that was a larger size. Uh, it's a quarter inch, I think. Let's see. Nope. 0.2795, I'm not sure what drill bit size that was, but it's whatever I had laying around at the time. Um, so that's plenty big enough for you know three strands of paracord if you wanted to, uh, and that's made out of aluminum. Well, very, very soon after that, got into titanium, um, and I was amazed that I was able to, to use uh, and, and make stuff out of titanium. Um, but carbide tooling these days, it, it makes it very easy on you. You don't have to learn how to run the speeds and feeds so super slow with high speed steel. So carbide is a blessing. This one is a jacked up knurl bead that I made. This is the oil can um, bead design. And that was the uh, first like main, uh, it was the first popular bead design that I came up with. I sell very, very many of those uh, in different, all different material types. Here's one in turbo glow. I wish I had my light on me. Ugh, not prepared. I wish I had my light on you. I could on me. I, I could show you how bright Turbo Glow is. This is a green Turbo Glow. Um, this was somewhere in between. I think that was somewhere in between this bead and this bead. So in progression. Uh, that's made of brass. Oh, let's see, this is a titanium bead that I intended, intended to give away a few uh, months ago, but I never got around to it. But this is titanium that has been uh, heat colored. People say heat anodized. That's not exactly, not exactly uh, correct, but that's okay. This is, it's heat colored. It's a heat, um, yeah, we'll just, we'll, it grows oxide layer, uh, but it's not anodization. So that's titanium. Um, next thing I would have made, uh, probably I would have to go back and look and see um, how, what the progression was like through my Instagram, but here is a top and I wanted to make something unique and I feel like that is pretty unique, a unique shape. Although it does, it is very top heavy. Um, it's, a, it's a big mover, uh, not particularly my best work but hey you got to start somewhere right so that top that's 360 brass uh, this is one of the next this is a titanium stem and you can tell by the machining on there and the lines that are on there that this is not very this is very very early on in my machining career and it's got battle scars around the rim from from flinging it across the room trying to learn how to spin but I was trying to get all the weight towards the outside and keep the light, the center as, as light as I could. Um, and the point is a little too far down that way, if you ask me, uh, from what I've learned now. Um, so the next one after that would probably have been this one. This is a solid copper. Very, very simple design. Learned a lot since then, obviously. Uh, this would have been after somewhere after this came this design, which I'm very proud of this. I have several of these out in the wild um, and very, very close to that exact design. Um, so that was the first viable top, uh, although it is a one piece. Um, then I moved on to multi-piece tops. I don't have a lot of the first ones that I made, but um, here's one. These are all these I'm keeping for sentimental reasons. We'll put that one on there too. These are I'm keeping for sentimental reasons. Um, these are all wobblers. Um, well, actually, this one is not a wobbler. This one I just really, really like. It's a very cool design. Um, spins very, very well. I just don't want to get rid of it because I like to spin it. So I kind of, kind of nailed it on that one. And I may do that one as a one-piece production model in the future. Um, this one. Of course, it is a multi-piece. We'll go back to it. Um, brass outer ring, titanium uh, inner ring, which this silver here is the same as the silver. It's all one piece. 
Um, so, and then the stem is a, uh, I believe a three alloy titanium, titanium zirconium Nix mascus, which we'll, we'll get to that here in just a few minutes. I'll try to keep this short, um, but we'll, I'll try to hit everything. Um, this one I just made the other day, a couple, maybe a week and a half ago, two weeks ago. This is a tungsten outer ring. This is a um, Nix Mascus. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not Nix Mascus. This is just a random uh, basket weave titanium that I had lying around the shop uh, on the center ring. And again, it's the same piece. This is the same piece as this that's showing on the inside. And then the stem is zirconium. And I got the proportions dead on on this one. I'm very, very proud of this one, but it's a wobbler, so it will not be sold. Um, if I did sell it, it would be at a, a tremendous discount. Uh, we already went over that one, and then this one is also a wobbler. I did, um, this is a titanium and zirconium bold Nix Mascus on the bottom, and a zirconium ring, and then the stem is I believe that stem, yeah, that stem is titanium. So there's that. So um, kind of jumped ahead in the timeline, but these would have been next, and then uh, I came out with my spinner after uh, these types of tops. So this is uh, 001. This is the first spin of my thing. Um, I got a torque bar. Actually, I was working on a torque bar for a customer. It was a titanium one, and I said, man, I want one of those. I looked at, um, I looked them up online. I was like, man, you know, I really like them. I really think they're cool, but I just can't afford to buy one. I'm, I'm just broke. I'm just super broke, uh, and and um, just can't afford to buy one. So I said, I'm gonna make my own. Well, I had a little, little uh, Japanese, or I'm sorry, Japanese, a uh, little Chinese made um, grizzly mill and drill and and lathe combo, and I was able to knock that, knock that piece right there out on that combo. Quickly realized that I needed to upgrade my tooling. You can tell that there is a taper on the outside because the whole rotary table when I was cutting was cocking over to the side and causing a taper on the outside. I had to upgrade a lot of things. So that's 001. You can tell it's got very, very sharp edges, not very finished. That's okay because I wasn't planning to sell it. That was just for me. Um, this is going to be the let's see we'll do this one this is from the first production run this was actually a uh, x out that did not meet so up at experimental tester um, that's what xt stands for on that one and you can tell it's wobbly but that was from the first production run uh, and uh, it did not make the cut you can tell that the cham is not chamfered but actually rounded corners on that one uh, next would have been, this is a stainless steel from the second production run. It is stamped 032. It's pretty good. It's just a little bit out of balance and I did not feel comfortable selling it. Uh, I would be able to fix this today knowing what I know now. So that is stainless steel. There are very, very few of those out there. And those would have come with a regular Mokuta, two alloy Mokuta button. Um, if you ever find one, one of those out there. Uh, this is a second production run titanium stamped 50 and again a wobbler just not comfortable anything that i keep has usually got something wrong with it um, <clears throat> this is going to be probably yeah that's a third production run titanium so you can see the the uh, progression of the chamfer and these are all hand ground on a on a belt grinder so I would have locked my, my wrists at an angle and just went with it. So that was all done by hand. So there are several of those out there in titanium. Uh, this is the same, same batch, that third production run. This one had a bunch of scars on it uh, from like, they probably dropped it on the floor and uh, ended up keeping it. So it actually is fairly balanced. <clears throat> so if I hadn't have dropped that one and, and didn't have that big scar right there, it would have ended up sold. Of course, that finish is, is horrific uh, just because I've used it so much. So, uh, Let's see. We've went over that one. This one is a zirconium. Also, it's either third production run or fourth production run. Same chamfer style, small chamfer. Um, the Turbo Glow, I've got those in 
many methings I do not have any turbo glow full size methings but you can tell that by then the chamfer had widened these are mini methane prototypes. This is the first prototype. You can tell I got it bad off balance, so I had to drill it out, and it's janky as I'll get out. Uh, but that was the mini methane prototype. And then this was another mini methane prototype, also out of balance. Uh, let's see, I have got one that I have kept because it's out of balance as well, and out of respect for the auction piece that went up. I'm not, never going to sell that one. That is a it's called Big Top Mokuta, a very special pattern. Mokuta, excuse me, Mokuta on that one. So that one's mine, keeping it. Um, so let's see. Here's a, this is fairly recent in the last few months. Uh, well, I'd say probably early, early last year. Um, serial number 189. Uh, I'll throw some buttons on it. Just have these laying over here on the bench. Throw these buttons on it, and so that's what a spinner thing is going to look very similar to these days. Maybe a little bit bigger chamfers because I kept going deeper and deeper and deeper with the chamfers, and I liked it. So uh, more like that that chamfer depth these days. These are 100% handmade. Every every aspect of this is handmade except for. The actual post, I buy those from McMaster Car. The actual screw post that screws into the button to hold them together, and the bearing. I use FZ Essentials, uh, either SS Super or a um, SB V2, whichever one he has available at the time. So, shout out to Heck. Thank you, Heck, for awesome bearings. So, there's that. And then, versus now, these days, I'm making what's called the Machinima thing. And it's a progression of the design from this to this. And so a lot of people, I've sent the prototypes out, a lot of people are really liking this area here for your finger to get a good pull. And uh, that, was the, that was the thought behind it. And then of course these have sharp corners. So I addressed that here with a very nicely radius corner. Very, very nice on your fingers. So. Hopefully, um, the, the pre-order went very well for these, and hopefully everybody really, really enjoys those. Um, so this one being handmade and this one being CNC machined. All right. So I've uh, got a couple more things to look at in the case, and then we'll move on to showing you what the difference is. Um, these are some of the first Mokuta buttons I ever made. I think these are 22 millimeter. This was my first foray into Mokuta. So, not bad for my first shot. Um, then this is uh, Mocha May. This is a three alloy uh, Mike Sackmar from Sackmar Industries. This one is slightly patinaed, and this one I keep clean. Um, so that's a three alloy from Mike Sackmar. Uh, just showing you the exotic metals. Um, and then this is a uh, this is my own. Mokume material and so when I made this material all the brass squeezed out from in between the layers of copper and in between the layers of nickel. So you can see very very thin lines if it would focus focus there we go very very thin lines in between the copper and the nickel and that's where the brass I overheated the billet and the brass all squeezed out it was pretty cool uh, it wasn't cool at the time because I had molten metal rolling all over my shop but it ended up having a very cool effect with the super thin lines of brass in there. So, uh, and then these, of course, have patinaed because uh, I've used them so much. Then, and I, I embrace the patina. Um, a lot of people hate patina and they polish it off. I actually embrace the patina. It gives the piece more character, in my opinion. I'm not trying to crap on anybody's opinion. Then this is a bold Nixmascus pattern. Um, alloy, uh, let's see, titanium alloy and zirconium alloy. So, on the Pose Blades Cocoon. Awesome, uh, awesome spinner if you don't have one of those. Then, let's see, oh yeah, and that was a zero feed compass. If you don't know Rick, Rick's an awesome dude. Rick's a friend of mine. Rick makes the compass. This is a compass mini. Titanium. Love it. Still carry that. 
from time to time. Um, this is a three alloy titanium Nix Mascus set of buttons, and that was is the low heat colors. That's the high heat colors. I make all that material myself, uh, along with this and that. Then these are other people's materials. Uh, this is uh, Chad Nichols Big Top Mopey Tie and a button. Of course, the colors don't show up great because we're indoors and indoor lighting is harsh, so it just ref it reflects harshly. Um, this is a two alloy Mopey Tie. These fit a ring spin. Um, this had a flaw, so I wasn't able to, to sell those, so I figured, hey, might as well keep them. Uh, this is a basket weave Mopey Tie. From, also from Chad Nichols, Nichols Damascus. Um, I've got a couple tags here. This is my Mokume. Again, it's that same pattern with the squeezed out brass and it's a little mini tag that I make. Here's a, also a mini tag with the bold pattern Nix Mascus. You can kind of catch those colors. You can see them there and that looks a little better. Um, and then these are this is that same three alloy. I'll just throw that to the side. These are just little coins I cut off the end of the billet. And then this is a unicorn horn. Um, so this is a mosaic pattern, a very very simple mosaic, but a mosaic nonetheless. So various stacking and welding and rewelding techniques to come up with a mosaic style pattern which I, I plan on developing that further in the future. It's just uh, a matter of developing my skill. But that's titanium, titanium, and zirconium. So, alright. Alright, I'm going to take you off this tripod and then walk you down to the end of the shop and uh, we will talk about the machines. Alright, so we're here in front of the CNC mill. This is a Haas TM1P. Um, so this guy, uh, I don't know much about it yet because I haven't used it very much, but I'm running my pre-order for the machinima thing on this machine. Uh, do not have it powered up right now. There's no sense in going through a super, super detailed explanation. But after learning and tweaking and um, massaging, uh, doing, uh, learning how to do tool changes, learning how to do fixturing, um, it's a big, big undertaking. Uh, it's something that I'm uncomfortable with, but hopefully will gain some comfort with because it's necessary to increase my production to keep up with demand. So um, I'll show you the raw material. Let me grab some. This is just one particular type of raw material. There's different shapes and sizes that you can put in the machine, but um, this is a piece of bronze. At 600 thousandths by uh, one, about 1.1 inches by 2.1 inches. So on, that's what it looks like to begin with. On the after the first operation, then it's going to look somewhat like this, where the top of the spinner is cut, and the bottom uh, where I was holding on. So the vice grips here. So where I was holding on to is still attached. And then we'll do a second operation. And after that uh, second operation, the, it'll be placed onto a fixture like this. And after that second operation, it looks like this. Looks like a finished piece. So that's, uh, and it's all automated. So you have to program every single little move that the machine makes. Um, and thank you to uh, Nick, uh, Nick at FTO. Thank you so much for helping me get off the ground. Also for Steve Ripplinger. Uh, thank you for walking me through a lot of things in Fusion to, to get everything started up. Um, Y'all were a huge help. Uh, and there's, uh, of course, other folks that have uh, lent me little pieces of, uh, of uh, little tidbits of information here and there, and I greatly appreciate that. So uh, thanks for helping me get off the ground. Um, now we'll move on to the, uh, to the manual machine. So here are the manual machines. I've got a few examples in my hands. Um, of what kind of work goes into running these machines. Um, so this machine is a variable speed head uh, Accelo mill uh, built in the 1970s-ish, 1980s, late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, still an awesome mill and I love it. I uh, got this one last year and rebuilt it. Um, not, not the entire thing but changed a few bearings and then put new lead screw nuts and all that in it. Um, and then this is this machine right here 
is my Bridgeport. Um, it is a it is a uh, pulley driven head, um, and that one I have my rotary table set up on. So the difference, the distinction in that machine over there, which is the CNC machine, and these machines is every single cut has a direct input from me. Um, so each each spinner is going to have multiple setups per spinner. There are something like 15 or 16 different operations per spinner, whereas there are two operations on the CNC machine. Um, the table moves like an Etch-a-Sketch. You've got a Y-axis, and you've got an X-axis, and then you have a Z-axis, uh, which is the, the quill here, um, and also the, the knee of the machine. So. You can't really make curves on these machines except for using the rotary table. So setting up on the rotary table, I'm able to do the outside curve uh, of the spinner thing. So first, again, the raw material looks the same. It's going to look like this. Every side of that material has to be machined down to correct dimension within a couple thousandths. And then it would look like this. So you're taking this, whoop, taking this and you're going to this. Then you're gonna drill holes. I say you and me, I'm gonna drill holes um, and get it set up for um, the, bearing, the, the button pocket. So it's gonna end up looking like this. So each time you do this thing, each side that you work on is another operation and another setup in a vise. So this uh, hole has been drilled through the center, uh, correct to dimension to fit the, the R188 bearing. Then the button pocket has been cut. And then the same thing, button pocket cut from this side. And then after that, chamfers are cut using the angle vise. And so it'll go from like it was in that last one to this, this from this to this. Then, over there on the rotary table it's set up and it goes from this with square edges to this with round edges. Then uh, deburring and finishing and assembly and, and all that. Uh, and then I'm not going to go too into depth with each of these things because we'll, we'll get to that at a later date. There's plenty of videos to be made. I'm going to pan you over here to the lathe. Of course it's a wreck. Uh, I apologize for the mess but this is where every set of buttons that I have made uh, so far has been made on this machine or on the old Grizzly machine. Um, and, and again, this moves like an Etch-a-Sketch. This handle makes the carriage go back and forth. And this handle right here makes the cross slide go back and forth. And then this one makes the compound go back and forth. So again, hard to make curves with an Etch-a-Sketch. <laughs> that's, my, that's my favorite analogy um, for these manual machines. So, uh, But these manual machines, that's where I started. That's where I cut my teeth and that's where I have, really have a passion for actually making things using my skill. Um, and then I am moving on to CNC to be able to offer the things that I make at a greater volume. Um, so to me, the Spinema thing has a very special place uh, in my heart and I'll always be able to make the spinema thing. Um, got, you know, Lord willing, I'll be able to make the spinema, the spinema thing for years to come using these manual machines. I don't plan to stop making the spinema thing anytime soon. So, um, I think that really, uh, I think that really wraps up the video for today. Um, uh, again, I'm going to try to have one of these, uh, Modus Works Monday videos out every, um, every single Monday. Uh, and I'm going to really try to push myself to do that. Uh, I'll try not to put out boring content just for the sake of making a video. So if I'm not feeling it, I may not make a video that week, but uh, I'll try to make it worth your while to sit down and watch the video for, you know, I don't know what this will be, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, um, what, however long the video will end up being. So I just want to thank you for your support. Uh, it, I could not do this if it weren't for the people that support me and, and the people that buy the products. Uh, I'm able to do this full time. Um, so I thank you again and uh, appreciate you watching the videos. Uh, have a nice day and uh, we'll see you next time.